Okay, are you ready? <laughs> Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Panilla Jonsson and I'm the program secretary of SLU Future Food, one of SLU's four future platforms. Today we will give this lunch seminar called How to Transform Science into Action, Role of the Worldwide Fund in Achieving Sustainable Production and Consumption of Food. And we are co-organizing this with the SLU Master Program, uh, Sustainable Food Systems. I'll keep this introduction short, um, but I just want to mention uh, that... If you are curious about SLU Future Food and what we do, there's a good opportunity this coming Tuesday to come and meet us in this same room uh, and to ask questions. And it's between 11 and 12. So if you want more information about this, check out uh, our calendar on our website. Today's seminar will uh, start with an opening seminar uh, between 12 and, and 1. And then we will have a short break. So those of you who cannot stay for the discussion can leave. And then we will continue with the discussion between 1 and 2. And this discussion will be led by um, Cecilia Mark Herbert, who is a researcher and lecturer here at SLU in business economics. And now I say welcome to Anna Rickert, who is an SLU alumnus, and she has a degree in horticulture, and has spent uh, all her professional life, I think, <laughs> uh, on sustainability issues and uh, connected to food and food production and consumption. So, welcome, Anna. Thanks, Pernilla. So, I'll, I'll trade places here so yeah. you can see me in the presentation, too. Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, great, thanks. Um, so, nice to be here. I am a proud alum, alumni, or alumnus, or what you call it, from SLU. I graduated in uh, 1997 when some of the people are sitting in here were close to me in that, at that time. And are still close. So I, uh, I'm very happy to be back here and speaking to you. So we're going to have a session, and um, we're going after, uh, at the very end of that. There's going to be a questions and answers uh, part a section um, before we f make a break and then go into the discussion. So if you have questions, then just keep them and uh, write them down and put them uh, to me at the very end between at. Uh, about 45 or something. We'll see where, what happens. So I work at WWF since uh, five years. And uh, my responsibility at WWF is to coordinate their work on sustainable food. And I think this is the most wonderful job that you can ever have. And I, I'll, I'll be retiring in 15 years. So you can you know, make yourself ready. <laughs> because this is so much fun. And it's really, really complicated and difficult. And all my gray hairs, well, m many of them are attributed to this uh, situation that I mean that we are actually working on one of the most important areas that you can imagine. And WWF, you might wonder if I can do this. Da -da -da. Da -da 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 -da. There we go. Yeah. Oh, that. <laughs> That doesn't look so good. It's supposed to say uh, that uh, uh, <laughs> this is actually a picture that I, I stole from my food practice leader in WWF, uh, Joao Campari. So he's Brazilian, and uh, that, that's not Brazilian. <laughs> but it says that actually food is one of the biggest threats to conservation, and WWF is a conservation organization. We were born from, from protecting the big animals, the animals... Uh, habitats and, uh, and uh, doing work to make us stay within the planetary boundaries. And we have two big, big goals. It is to stay within the planetary boundaries and to preserve and develop biodiversity. So those are our two big agendas. And sometimes they are conflicting, sometimes they interrelate, and sometimes they merge. So we have a very interesting work 
in the big collective that are people that work at WWF all over the world. And um, this is not going to work. <laughs> we should have checked this. <laughs> uh, we're, uh, suddenly these figures have you know, changed into symbols of some kind of weird, weird thing. But what I want to say here is that uh, WWF made the analysis, if we don't work at food, we won't be able to achieve our overarching goals. So a couple of years ago, uh, WWF introduced food as one of its six focus areas. And that was really new to the organization. And so by that you re realize we have been working on forests, on wildlife, on the Arctic, on the climate for quite a long time. But the food area is new. So that means that it's under creation. It's also under uh, development. And uh, this is, um, offers opportunity, but it's also, we're quite a young part of WWF. <laughs> okay, we'll have more times for questions and answers uh, at the very end. So what happens, uh, we have a food practice. That was what the other picture was going to say. We have a food practice which gathers people, my colleagues, from all over. Uh, many of the European work offices work on food. The U.S. office works on food. It's emerging in Southeast East Asia. The African offices are coming when it comes to food. South Africa is really, really strong. Uh, Latin American offices are naturally focusing on their uh, part of regarding soy and the big commodities that leave uh, Latin America and come to, to different parts of the world. So it's a bit different in, in the WWF family, who does what. And uh, on World Food Day, a couple of days ago, uh, we launched a si website that shows what, what, what WWF does on food and what, which offices does what. And it actually turns out that the Swedish office is, is in the lead. Yay! <laughs> and for that, we can be very proud. So we have been working for many years on soy, beef, palm oil, the big commodities. But what is new since uh, just before I came to WWF is our work on sustainable diets. And we'll be going into a bit of that soon. Hmm? Du skiter det. Jaha. Ja, vi kanske kan ta det till diskussionen. Jag tror att vi lämnar det just nu för att jag kände att jag fick säga det. Ni missade lite av siffrorna och det kanske kan komma ut i presentationsmaterialet om ni vill titta på det. För att eh, det blir så stressigt om man ska liksom gå tillbaka och hitta det där. Ja, 70 procent av vattenanvändningen är kopplad till... Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, they, they were asking if they should, uh, should uh, get the the pictures in a PDF file, and I said that uh, I think we'll just skip the figures. Um, I think you get the general point uh, that food stands for X percent of the water use and is a major contributor to the loss of biodiversity. Uh, 20 to 30 percent of climate uh, emissions are connected to food, blah, blah, blah. I think you are aware of this. You should be, anyhow. Pernilla hasn't done her job if you aren't aware of this. <laughs> so. So now we come to what's happening in WWF Sweden. And this is a picture where, where I just dumped down some of our activities that are connected to food. And uh, all of these are, uh, well, they're in different sectors of society. Some of them are merged towards consumers, towards changing consumer attitudes. Some of them are working towards getting companies to move and transform their offer to consumers. And we also, which is not actually available there, uh, have a public side. Oh, the White Guide Junior and the White Guide Green. White Guide Junior really is uh, aimed at uh, public pr procurement and school food systems on a local level. So we have activities that move across the whole range and uh, we'll go down into some of these uh, projects shortly. But what I wanted to say to you is that we in WWF have a mission that we are supposed to be science-based. And that is, of course, a big challenge. How do you actually relate to science? How do you use results that come out of science into a tool that we can take and transform to our purposes and move on 
to consumers or businesses or uh, politicians. That, that is what we will be talking about today, and you have to keep this in your mind because we will be coming back to that very issue at the end discussion. How is science actually taken on through the whole system? So the first example that I wanted to dive into is the WWF Sweden Meat Guide, which used to be the, the SLU Meat Guide, <laughs> which was created here uh, by Elin and her company, uh, colleagues, and uh, the mastermind who is sitting right here. Uh, and uh, what happened, and my analysis of this is that double, uh, SLU created this within a project, but there was no real possibility or you know, well, possibility to take this on and to get it to fly in a structured way. So what we did was we got an offer from Elin to take this on and to move the guide to WWF, use all the background materials and work with it. <coughs> and I was, at that time, I'd been working at WWF for I think half a year, one year maybe. Um, and I thought, wow, this is going to be cool. We have a fish guide since 2002. Of course we should have a meat guide. And I am totally convinced that WWF did not know what they were signing up to. <laughs> because this is much more complicated than the fish. Uh, or It's different. I mean, the fish guide contains both farmed, but it's focused on the wild fish, the wild caught fish, and the, what is core to WWF to preserve the habitats and to the ecosystems and work with the fishing industry to get them to use better uh, harvesting or fishing techniques and things like that. So the meat guide came in as something totally new. It was also a bit different in its construction. It had the same concept with the traffic light system as the fish guide. So that it made it easier for us to take it over. But it's, it was also, it had much more clear the five different categories, climate, biodiversity, uh, pesticides, animal welfare. Which one did I forget? Those were the four, four ones that we took over from SLU. And then we added antibiotics. So uh, that was the relaunch 2016. And these components all have their traffic light system and um, the criteria, we tweak them a bit for our purposes, and we added the criteria for antibiotics. And when we added the criteria for antibiotics, we built that on a system that was developed for the Swedish uh, food chain, not by us, but by Axe Foundation and a couple of company partners. So there was something in the Swedish sector that was already accepted and uh, that we could move with. So we integrated that into the meat guide, and now we have a meat guide. And it's been sitting still ever since 2016. So in 2019, we are planning a relaunch where we will be doing some updating, some more focus on imported meat. And we're also synchronizing this as far as we can. And this is a big challenge to our international colleagues. Because right now, France, Belgium, Austria, and Estonia are working to create similar guides. So you can see that this material that was born here in SLU is, you know, taking off into, into the WWF world, which is fantastic. I'm quite sure that there will be more offices who, are, who will be working. However, this is also interesting from a research point of view. What is the importance of the local context? Because this guide is developed here in Sweden for a Swedish context. What happens when you transform this to an Austrian or a Fr French context? Now we are having, for example, quite interesting uh, discussions because there's a climate parameter in the guide and uh, the Austrians just raised the question to us. They have a different climate database than we have. So the climate data is not synchronized uh, globally. How, how would that happen? Nobody has that kind of mandate or that kind of work today. Which means that conventional chicken in Sweden gets a green light in, in climate but conventional chicken in Austria looks like it's going to get a yellow light in climate. What is a, well, I mean, right now food isn't traded between Austria and Sweden, so we don't have this obvious problem. But if it were Germany, for example, that would make quite a problem for companies like, 
Well, Germany was a bad example. Well, okay, say Hokuskan, the, the meat, meat company. If our, the meat was assessed in a different way in Sweden and in Germany. So this sort of puts the light on the fact that local context, local uh, knowledge bases, and moving towards uh, the need for a, a coordination of facts and figures. This is something that's done within the, meat, the fish guide, but we are not there yet with the meat. I think it's much more complex with the different local production systems, different regulations, and things like that. So we have a big challenge, but we also have a big potential because this is a good tool for communication with consumers. And we also want retailers and meal providers to take this tool and uh, edit, choice edit for consumers so that it becomes easier for consumers. And that is happening now with the fish guide that uh, retailers are taking out fish with a red light from their system and moving up the scale. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if they could do the same thing for meat? Take out the meat that has a red light and move two yellow and two green and get, get the whole bell-shaped curve moving upwards towards increased sustainability. I'm going to um, move away from this picture soon, but I just want to mention that this is quite an quite interesting area when it comes to companies and public procurement. How do you actually procure good meat? How do you shop good meat when you are a retailer? And uh, that's uh, something that we're thinking quite a lot about. So, uh, you may have some questions on that. We can get back to that in the discussion. Okay, so that was the meat guide, born here and now is going global. Uh, the One Planet Plate is something that we are working now to, ve to develop, or rather, no, that's the Veggie Guide. Uh, we launched the One Planet Plate uh, earlier this year. And this is born here at WWF. It, uh, uh, from, it was a brainchild that uh, I had and that some of us uh, started talking about together with a couple of consultants in the network and seeing what is actually a meal that can uh, stay within the planetary boundaries. And um, it was quite natural to start thinking about climate, but being WWF, we had to move a step fur further. We had to integrate at least one, and we would have liked to integrate, the, su integrate some more of the parameters, sustainability param parameters for the planet. So we entered into this work. We got some financing from the postcode lottery, and we uh, launched this One Planet Plate earlier this year. So it's a meal concept, and uh, the target is restaurants, chefs, meal providers, and in a sense, the general com consumer. But we also always need to talk about the interested consumers, those who are there and who will be driving the consumers forward. And um, this is quite, quite tricky because we developed, uh, we said, we have to work towards the 1.5 scenario. Uh, and at that time, the IPCC did not have very good uh, figures on 1.5, so everybody was working towards 2.0 degrees warming, global warming we're talking about. Uh, but we decided, okay, WWF needs to have a very sharp uh, and strong uh, agenda, so we did 1.5. And I think, well, it's a bit complicated because it... it in fact, it means that there's not much room for animal-based uh, food. But on the other hand, that shows how, how difficult and also how possible it is to eat according to this 1.5 uh, 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 emissions target. So 1.5, um, that means we calculated it down to 0 0.5 kilos of carbon equivalents per meal. And those of you who eat at Max Hamburgers may have seen their, calcu their calculations. One hamburger meal uh, with a meat hamburger is uh, about 3.5, 3.3 uh, kilograms of carbon equivalent. So you see right then that you have, you know, you have shot your whole uh, budget for a couple of days. Well, for a day or two. A day. You can eat a hamburger. And that's about it. Um, that sort of shows us the challenge. 
uh, climate-wise. And we did really struggle not to make this a vegan concept. So we also calculated, okay, what does this mean over a week? A weekly menu. How can, uh, is there room for fish, meat, milk, eggs in a weekly menu? And yes, there is. I'll just show it to you in a minute. Uh, but being WWF, of course, we had to have biodiversity, as I said. So how do you do this? And we had a quite an interesting workshop with researchers from here, from RISE, and from, who else? I forgot. A couple of, we sat around the table and uh, discussed, uh, oh, the Resilience Center, Stockholm Resilience Center, and um, discussed what would be a good biodiversity target for a meal. And think for yourselves, do, can you imagine that? I mean, it's quite easy if you're eating meat to say, okay, it should be natural pasture meat, because that's meat, beef with the highest positive impact on biodiversity. But what else? Okay, there's one big thing that we can do, responsible soy. No deforestation should be connected to the meal that is on our plates. And that's a clear biodiversity measure. And uh, there are certifications, so we know quite well. And in Sweden, that's, there's a soy dialogue, which is, has been convened by WWF. So Swedes, in general, don't eat much soy that is... Well, there is some, of course. But I mean, the, the, in Sweden, it's easier to eat soy that has not caused deforestation than in other countries. And uh, by eating, I mean also indirect eating, the soy that comes through the meat that is imported. So we um, made a decision that meat and fish should be, have a green light in our guides because that would steer towards uh, what we said, um, no uh, deforestation connected to the, the um, production, and also it would bring with it many other positive benefits. Um, and also this natural pasture meat comes in green light in the meat guide. But we also decided we must do something on the field level because uh, you know, a mono monoculture cultivation of grains, um, rapeseed, uh, the big crops in our diets, um, we are seeing some concepts emerging such as uh, large plots where you, you know, enable for more birds in the agricultural landscape uh, border zones, what do you call them? Um, Kantzoner, what's that in English? Border zones, uh, which should be, uh, in, in the best case, sown with flowers to enable more uh, insects and uh, food for, for an environment for biodiversity. So we decided that there should be, in this concept, biodiversi biodiversity me measures for field-grown crops, the big ones on our plate. Not everything. I mean, we don't, we don't want to put a demand on basil or uh, parsnips or something that, you know, is, uh, well, parsnips should be of major importance, but it's uh, kind of minor importance right now. Um, so we did the big crops, and we, we said that right now the verification for that is organic. Because organic production, we know it decreases biodiversity in the agricultural landscape. But we can also see some concepts coming. For example, Svensk Sigil, a certification for uh, production here in Sweden, is integrating biodiversity measures. And when that happens, they will also become a, a verification for this. So that restaurants can procure according to a system of sorts. So, I need to check what time it is. I, mean, I, I could talk about this for, for four hours. So, I mean, you have to, st you have to stop me <laughs> if I'm talking too much. Uh, this is the weekly menu, and it's in Swedish, so you're, all of you are not going to be able to read it. Uh, but it, what it shows is that it's, this keeps us within the 1.5 target. And it's diverse. It can, contains... Uh, Soup, falafel, potato balls, uh, chanterelles and bean pasta, veggie bur burgers, zucchini with the pea pa pesto, tacos with soy, and the breakfasts. I mean, I don't eat breakfasts like that. They're wonderful. So this is what I would probably eat if I were going skiing or something. So, and it's all been calculated nutrition-wise. This f fulfills... Uh, the nutri nutritional need of a person like me, who is moderately active and is uh, a female. 
So there may be higher needs and there may be lower needs. But this sort of it, it, it targets uh, a big group of consumers. You can also see that there's a couple of, of animal related, uh, there's a spaghetti with mussel sauce, there's uh, there is uh, cod, there is uh, naturbetes beef, it's a natural pasture meat beef with, in a wok, which is kind of weird way to use natural pasture beef. If you, if you buy that, you should treat it like a royal piece of meat and you know, I wouldn't mix it in a something like that, actually. <laughs> but oh, whatever. And there's quite quite a lot of eggs. There's uh, milk, and um, I think that's it for the animal side. Yeah. So it's possible. It's. I mean, the signal here is it's it's really possible. It's enjoyable and it's healthy. It fulfills your health need to eat within the planetary boundary of climate. Because what we need to do is we need to reach stakeholders that are outside this group of people that probably most of you in here are quite aware. Most people that I usually talk to and who come to Leafs Mills Forum and the, this, uh, stakeholder, these stakeholder meetings in Sweden, we need to reach outside of those who usually hear our messages because this transformation is actually going too slow. We need for more people to eat less but better meat. We need for more people to eat more pulses, more greens. And we need for more people to be aware. And I mean, you, know, you can't throw, push something into the throat of anyone, actually. That was tried with the geese. It's not a good idea. It's not a good idea to force people, f force things on people force information on people. You have to show what's funny, happy, healthy, um, it, and find the trigger points. And uh, we are just now in the process of, of uh, the first stages of a project that's really, really fun for us. And that's working with the Swedish Olympic Committee. It's called Vego i världsklass. Veggie for, world, for the world class. It targets um, people with a very, very active lifestyle and it targets Olympic athletes. So what, what is going to happen in this project is uh, we're going to develop a veggie guide. It's ongoing. It's ongoing here. And uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it will be the basis for a lot of our com communication. When you eat more vegetarian food, how can you avoid these uh, to fall into other sustainability traps? How can you avoid to in increase the amount of chemicals in your diet? How can you avoid to to uh, have products that are actually draw more energy than you think they do because they are vegetarian, but they're quite processed. So there's quite a lot of information that we need to know about this veggie thing. It's like um, a transformation from meat to vegetables would be just, okay, eat any veggie you want. And in the television, I don't know if any of you saw this who are Swedish speaking, but in the, the um, news uh, on Sunday, there was an interview and the thing about this project, there was an interview with a swimming athlete, and he was eating 12 avocados in a smoothie. And, uh, I mean, avocado, we need to think about that. What does it do? It causes deforestation. When the, big, uh, when the avocado production grows, we need to know what happens, and can we actually be recommending this? We think probably not. So we need to get a good baseline, we need good research, stable figures, and we need to be able to go out and talk to people and say, okay, we are problematic, pro problematisera, we're making, a, we're, making, we need, we're making a bit more difficult for you here when you're changing from meat to a ve more vegetarian diet. But you need to think about this. And the key thing is here is to bring it out through this health and active lifestyle target group. And I mean, the Olympic athletes, <laughs> it's so much fun. They, they just go take this and run with it. So right now they have five ambassadors that are going to be presented in the next couple of weeks. So they're Olympic athletes who will be advocating this, this, this uh, project and talking to their peers and to the rest of the world about the, how, how they eat more vegetarian food and still are able to compete, perform, deliver. And um, 
I, this is one of the most fun projects that I actually started, but it's quite complicated also because the athletes, I mean, they're extremely competitive. So we're, we're struggling, WWF is struggling to keep up with their pace, actually. So that, but then I need to tell them, okay, we need good science, we need good data, we need a stable communication. Uh, so I think that balance is actually going to be quite wonderful. So look, look out for the veggie guide. It's supposed to come, uh, be presented in about a year. And um, there will be also communication about the project, these ambassadors, and the, they will be serving vegetarian food to the Olympic athletes in uh, their uh, training camps. And we will be educating chefs, educating them, and creating social media on it, and lots of good stuff what time it is. Yeah. Uh, that's, this is from this weekend. Now the uh, Olympic athletes are going to be greener. We want to show that it works. So from that, I'm going to go into something that's much less communicative, but I think may also be of major importance. Sustainable supply chain for food. That's it. I forgot to translate the headline. Sustainable supply chain for food in Sweden is uh, an initiative where we started up a collaboration between now 14, it started as 10, companies uh, in the Swedish supply chain. And the WWF has a history of being like a neutral convener of stakeholders. So we did the soy dialogue where we brought together companies for commitments on better soy. And uh, this is much more complicated because it addresses the whole supply chain for food. And what happens is we get all these companies, you can see them on the left-hand side there, of which uh, three big Swedish retailers covering 87% of the whole retail sector. And then the major suppliers on a Swedish level. So we started out with these companies, but we also say that it, at, it, it also contains a work for food that is eaten and sold in Sweden. So that means it has to cover food that comes into Sweden, is imported, and how, we, how they address those questions. And our role here is to convene them, to bring them together around the table, to establish the discussion which is difficult. How do you get people to our fierce competitors on economical issues to sit around the table and talk to each other and agree on a sustainability agenda? It has taken from 2015, <coughs> early 2015, to this spring, so that is uh, a bit more than three years, to actually create the conditions for us to be able to do something and uh, to be able to go outside the room and talk about things. So lots of you know, struggling, and uh, uh, it hasn't been an easy process, but I think, it, and it, it isn't a perfect result either, but it, it is as good as it can ever get, and nobody has done anything like this, actually. When you go outside Sweden, they ask us, how can you bring this, these people around the table? How can you start to... How can you get them to start making commitments? And we say, okay, they haven't actually started to make commitments, but they're going to, because now we have a structure for them to make commitments within, and they know that it's coming. So we have quite a lot of important steps to take as it comes. So uh, 14 participants, um, yeah, it's quite unique and it's quite fun. And it's not only, um, we're, we're a couple of colleagues. So my colleague Maggie Sreanström is project manager, Camilla Vallema from the company side, and I participate as experts. So there's three of us who have been working on this. You're not, gonna be, you're not going to be able to read it, this. I wanted to show it to you because it's available on the website in Swedish and English. So I'll share the link with, with you guys and uh, then uh, if you want to take a look at it. And if you are thinking of doing work uh, onwards, I think this would be an amazing thing to start thinking about. Uh, how can we participate in moving this agenda forward? Because this is a really complicated area and there's lots of things that need to be studied. So what we did was we, we did, first of all, we identified what, is, what are long-term sustainability components for different categories in the food chain. 
And we had uh, 10 areas, uh, areas, so climate, biodiversity, uh, soil quality, water, chemicals, uh, eutrophication. And then we added animal welfare, of course, and three components that relate to social aspects in the supply chain. And that is uh, not, WWF It's not our home sphere. We're not really comfortable there, but we gathered information and we also asked the companies to help us. So we have somehow gotten something good together there. So the left-hand document is the long-term sustainability part, categories and example of measures that you can do to create long-term sustainability. So there we dumped in big and small things. We, we haven't made a, a proper analysis of what is the first thing they should do, or what is the easiest thing, or what is the most cost-effective thing that they should do. So, well, you, t you take it and run with it and create and look and see and suggest to us what, what we could do next. But what the companies are most interested in is what they can do here and now. So uh, we developed this lifting the bottom and expanding the top. What lifting the bottom is, what do you need to phase out of the system for it to be reasonably sustainable? The th idea is you should be able to go into a retail store and what you buy should you know, be okay. Uh, and just to start defining that is quite new and interesting and it's quite challenging because that, there's a lot of stuff in our retail stores that you don't even want to know about. I mean, you are buying, you are buying stuff that is produced by people who can't live on the wage that they are paid for producing the stuff. Some, I mean, that's kind of example of a general level that is you know, really not okay. So that's an example of what we added in to the system. Uh, and this is an example here for dairy. I just picked a, picked a, a parcel out of the system. Uh, so um, expanding the top. Well, since it's retail, they have to be able to procure and find it. And uh, it's also reasonable to talk about the big certifications. So organic, EU organic, Krav, and uh, climate certified, which are, uh, actually, actually exists here in Uppsala uh, on uh, the milk side. But we also added credible verified other uh, sustainability issues because we recognize that the, the certifications, they don't do everything. There may be sustainability initiatives that are good, that we would like to promote, but we put up three, three criteria. It needs to be relevant, it needs to be transparent, and it needs to be third-party verified in some way. So there are a couple of those out on the Swedish market that, that will be exposed in a system like this. Raising the bottom for dairy, well, that could, for example, be responsible use of antibiotics in the production. Uh, no deforestation and responsible feed, and uh, no painful treatment. Some of these things steer towards more Swedish production, but not everything. Uh, for example, the responsible use of antibiotics is now, if you look at Denmark or Ireland, for example, they are establishing systems that, w that qualify for green light on antibiotics in the meat guide. And uh, so, so they also qualify there, actually, but they would probably not qualify on the animal welfare. So this is an, a discussion we've been having with the Swedish farmers that is uh, interesting and ongoing. So uh, I need to check what time it is. Yeah, we are doing fine. Um, so uh, those are the three areas that I would like to lift to you as examples of how we work. Uh, you saw the meat guide, you saw the one planet plate, you saw the veggie guide, and you saw the four areas, sustainable supply chain for food. Th these are examples that we work with. There's quite a lot of other th you know, things going on, sustainable restaurants, the natural pasture meat, but we're, we're not doing everything here now. But that, that's where we stop. But I want to round off by showing you this picture, and I actually, actually stole it from Elin at our launch of for one, pl for one Planet Plate. And you know what happens when we take science and we uh, create our stuff? Uh, we also always need to come in with some kind of a filter 
that is our judgment and evaluation of the science. So we need to uh, we need to always be able to say that okay, sci it's science based. But actually, I think we should all be, be a bit more clear that we also do it. We bring value into the system, and the simplifications, bedömningar och förenklingar. What would that be in English? Uh, bedömningar is how we how we, how we value the science that uh, academia creates, and simplifications. And we need to simplify things so that we can reach our target groups. So what happens is we, it's like a funnel. All the science comes in here, and we make a filter, and then we create our materials. And there's also quite a lot, a lot of things that we would like to pass back to science that would be, we would need more knowledge in because this, this area is, is under a big development and there's a big need of, of new, new facts, new figures on both technical aspects of the system but behavioral and the, uh, what we, Cecilia is going to go into with you quite soon on the business behavior be behavior side of things. What, what is a sustainable business model? How can we get this, these business people in sustainable supply chain for food to actually have business models that promote sustainability? I mean, we're suggesting to them measures that uh, are threatening their uh, cost efficiency. And how can we get them to set targets or you know, somehow promote sustainable sustainable systems. So there's a lot of need, need for knowledge. And finally, back to the role of WWF. Well, I haven't been talking so much about influencing policy, but that we those first bullet points, policy, the companies, and the consumers, we see those as, how would you say that in English? Communicer on the shell. Can anyone give me... <laughs> Communicating vessels, thank, thank you. Because politics are never going to move forward if it's too uncomfortable. They're not going to be elected. Companies, they may move forward, but they still need people to buy what they, what they eat. And in the consumer sector, it's unfair to say that the consumers is a big bunch of people. We know that it's a, something like a bell cave shaped curve with some early adopters, some front runners, some, uh, some the big masses and the laggards. So we need to get consumer tools for moving the bell-shaped ca curve of consumers forward. And we all actually also need to work on all these three areas at once. And when I came to WWF, my boss said, well, we got to focus. Anna, we got to focus. Well, what should we do? <laughs> I said we should do everything at once. And actually, that's what, 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 that's what we're trying to do right now. We are in Sweden. We're right now a bit weak on the policy side. We haven't been really successful, and we haven't had enough time to focus on influencing the political landscape here in Sweden. Extremely difficult. You have lots of big lobby groups, the farmers' organizations, and so. But then we have our fingers in there somehow. We do a good job on moving the companies. I think that is a good analysis. And we also have a strong idea that we should move consumers, but we should also help consumers so that it's not too difficult. Because the consumers won't do things if it's too difficult for them. It should, this lett att göra rätt. It should be easy to do the right thing. So uh, this is a tree that's supposed to be a, what, uh, our, our big values, our vision as a, a human in harmony with nature. And on, in the basis, you can see, you, you cannot see, because I, even I can't see, it's a bad picture. But the bullet points bring what, up what I want to say. Uh, WWF Sweden needs to convene stakeholders. I mean, getting people to talk, agree, sit down and uh, process we also need to listen, and that's where we need to listen to you guys and to listen to trends and what's happening in the rest of the world. And for us, it's like safeguarding the systems perspective. And a very good example of that is that we decided not to go just for climate in the one time plate. We need a broader view of the, the whole thing. So a systems perspective should be the background for what we do, and that makes it much more complicated, actually. Uh, let me see now how we're doing for time. Um, 
We now have 15 minutes left. So I want to open up for some questions. And I think we have a microphone, which you, Pernilla, will be walking around with. So where are we with questions? Yeah, there up there. Thank you for the very interesting talk. I have a question about the sustainable supply chains of foods. Is it only like the supply chain onto the supermarket or, or do you also consider like things as food waste? So, mm -hmm. Very good question. So the border is from primary production to the cash register in the supermarket. So uh, uh, food waste is included, yes. We have a working group on food waste, and we have a working group on these sustainable products. Uh, and we also have a working group on a roadmap for the future for, for these companies. And food waste, when we started out this initiative 2015, we said, well, let's start with food waste. That's the easy part. That was not the easy part. <laughs> because we didn't actually achieve uh, very much, and it was more complicated than we thought. Uh, and also the landscape is a bit more, more complicated. There are other stakeholders who are doing things that we need to relate to. So we haven't achieved much. We, are, we have gained some new knowledge through the discussions that have, has been happening. And that's partly what I said to you, to you all about um, challenging their business models. We did a couple of case studies on food waste where we realized that they, it's expensive for the companies to act on certain parts of the food waste uh, issue. And if it's, if it's expensive for the companies, then who is going to pay for it? And where is the financing going to come in? And then we actually landed in a discussion on if there's no general target in Sweden or in the company to lower food waste. And no target and it costs. It's not going to happen. So we needed a target. And if you set a target, then you can accept some costs because you're f f fulfilling a target they have committed to. So we need targets and measuring systems for food waste, and that's outside the scope of the sustainable supply chain for food. Good question, by the way. <laughs> More? Danilo, there? And then there. Uh, I was thinking of the Sustainable Food Chain project. Mm? What is the incentive of the companies to actually uh, do the sustainability yeah. measures? Okay, so the, these companies, they are front runners, they are leaders, and they perceive themselves as quite, uh, uh, as very good. And their incentive is to stay leading. So they wanted to get close to us and to, to work with us and work together. It was actually initiated by, by uh, Ika and Landmännen, who started bringing together a group. Uh, and um, I would say also a quite strong initiative for the Swedish companies is to get credit for the work that they are doing in the retail sector. So the retail suppliers are in this because they need for their good work to be visible. And we have been quite clear that, okay, we're not going to be promoting your companies, but we're, we're creating a structure where sustainability efforts can be visible in a dialogue between buyer and seller. So I think for the companies that are around the table, it's quite a strong incentive to actually expose how other products are performing that are, that are not coming from them. So it's, it's good for them if uh, the bottom is, is lifted in the in the retail from the retail to the cu customers so the we have we have the so question was if there was a, uh, exposure from retail to customers actually not yet i mean when it comes to things that are more sustainable it's like a competition uh, you can see will is uh, saying signalizing we go for all they go for everyone uh, and uh, that sort of drives, it, drives itself. The, they're keen and ready to communicate to consumers on increased sustainability. And Lantmen would really like to communicate more on their large plots, for example. So that part is easy. But raising the bottom, that's more difficult. How do you communicate to a consumer? Well, this 
these grains do not have uh, straw uh, growth regu re regulating agents. Whoever knew about that as a consumer and who wants to know that there are re growth regulating agents in a lot of the pasta that we're right now eating? Uh, speaking of things that are weird in our agricultural systems. <laughs> So uh, commu co communication to consumer, we haven't taken a strong grasp of yet. There was a question there. Thank you for a nice presentation. <clears throat> I wondered, this is, I don't know if it's a real question, but sometimes it seems like highlighting one product and that the people's awareness about this environmental footprint that is really good, but it has to be substituted with something else. Could it be contraproductive? That's, that's an extremely interesting question. Now, what, what happens, for example, if you buy responsible soy? Um, and the rep, the rep, that is produced... Well, I, I lost my thought, but... Uh, <laughs> May I ask you about a particular yes, product? Yes, do, do. <laughs> uh, the awareness about palm oil mm? have increased incredibly, and it's included in so many products. Mm? And uh, I think quite many people are aware of trying to avoid it. But if it would be substituted with some other oil, mm? what would happen? Because still it's quite intensified uh, agriculture, so probably you would mm. need, need more land to substitute this oil with some other oil. Yeah, yeah. And how to deal yeah. with these complicated issues. Well, that's a quite clear issue, uh, and because, because of the fact that palm oil is a very efficient crop. There's lots of oil output per, per square meter or hectare or whatever. Uh, substitution is quite interesting there because the... The, there's probably, a, or there is a big span in what you replace palm oil with. If you replace it with coconut oil, it's probably likely that you're going to have the same type of deforestation issues with that. If you replace it with uh, rapeseed oil, then you're going to have issues with uh, pesticide use and uh, where, where the rapeseed is produced and the fact that rapeseed produces less uh, per hectare than palm oil. So our position on the pol WWF Sweden's position on the palm oil issue has been not to avoid uh, or advise against the use of palm oil, but to say when you use palm oil, you should you have it you have responsible palm oil. And this communication is, I in my opinion, it's only possible towards the companies. So we need the companies to choice edit and to procure only palm oil with the highest degree of certification. And we know that the cert certification system has different levels in it. And the base level of the RSPO certification is, in my opinion, my humble opinion is not enough. So I think that the highest level of the, the palm oil certifications should be strived for in the retail and the, the companies who are producing food. Um, by that, we can also participate because Sweden is pre the percentage of uh, certified stuff that Sweden buys is, is quite high. So, if we were to draw out of these RSPO or RTRS for soy and to buy less of these, then we would lose our power in affecting these systems. So that's the rationale for WWF to still recommend the use of palm oil, but the use of very well certified palm oil. So that's an, uh, and of course that's more expensive. But the companies use palm oil because it's cheap. So again, we enter into the business model thing. Long answer to a complicated question. <laughs> uh, more questions? We have a couple of minutes. One, two, and three. Hi, um, I'm just curious about the uh, like the green lights for the animal products. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's still more; uh, they have more environmental footprint than like vegetable options. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have like um, a guide as well towards how often you can consume them? Because I guess people will like, well, this is green light; I can eat mm -hmm. this like every day. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's we saw. We, that's a risk that the project identified when, when the the meat guide was launched. That we can't say gre uh, the same, uh, because actually green light in the fish guide means eat. Period. But that's not uh, what you say in the meat guide. It means eat with moderation. Uh, yeah, but I guess people like interpret it very differently. Yeah, of course, of course, and um, the, sw the Swedish farmers interpret it in one way. <laughs> So, but the one planet plate was an uh, attempt to make some kind of a, uh, I mean, how much meat is the room for within the climate limits? Uh, and actually, I think um, that way, uh, it would have been better for us if we had uh, had a 2.0 target because we are now seeing some uh, stuff that's emerging uh, from. Uh, Springman et al. Uh, Eat Lancet Commission, blah blah blah. That there, there there's more meat in the, those diets, and actually that's quite uh, that will make it easier to get closer to consumers because it's quite harsh to say okay one 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 beef, one fish, and a couple of eggs per week, and that's not enough. That's about it. We used to have a communication on halving the meat consumption. But that's quite interesting because many of you here will already be there. You are many of you are women, and we know that women eat less meat than men, and uh, so uh, we may probably need to target this communication to men who eat a lot of meat need to perhaps more than half their consumption, uh, which we know. Yeah, especially like for fish consumption, because the dietary advice is mm -hmm. like very high, two, three times a week. Mm -hmm. And that's not really a sustainable way mm -hmm. of eating fish. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like problems with the nutritional slash sustainability mm -hmm. advice, especially on the fish. On the fish, on the fish side, it's a bit more complicated yeah. because we're getting some of these uh, farmed fish systems that may be able to supply us with some more parts of fish in the system. So that's quite... quite uh, uh, we're, we're a bit careful on all of that type of communication. How much meat is there room for? How much fish is there room for? But it's the question that I most frequent, frequently get asked. Yeah. So <laughs> I think we need to sort of get a better... But today you don't have like any recommendations for how, how often you should eat and shouldn't eat certain... We actually try to avoid that. Yeah. Because I'm thinking it's problematic if it's like, yeah, green light, I eat green yeah, light, yeah. beef and yeah. uh, dairy and yeah. fish like every day. I think we should be better at that, actually. I, I, I hear what you say. I think, I think we should be better at communicating that in a good way. But it's also difficult. I mean, poultry and then there's uh, beef and the, there's natural pasture beef that you actually need to put in there because we need the cattle to keep our natural pastures open, so it's not easy to, to create a fig figure like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, just I, I just uh, heard uh, Linda Gordon from the Resilience Center talking about how much poultry there was room for, and I think that uh, poultry is quite difficult in my point of, in my point of view, because it's, it's got a low climate impact, but they eat a lot of food that we could have eaten, and it's the most growing type of meat. So you would need to, you know, if you s talk how much meat can I eat, well, what type of meat? And would it be okay if we ate more like blood products or, or tails or things that are the other part of the animal that is not used? So you s quickly see that that kind of communication quickly needs to be you know, split up into sub-communications and then it becomes difficult. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I think now it's uh, <laughs> one o'clock. So can we have two short questions? Are or? you staying on for the discussion or do you have to leave? Mm? Okay. Yeah. And how about you? Okay. Okay. So uh, thank you, Anna, for a very interesting presentation. And thank you. <laughs> come back in uh, five minutes. Mm? <laughs> thank you. Okay, everyone, are we ready to start the discussion? Uh, is it Alnarp that is with us, or Skara, or who is? Skara is here. Okay, nice. <laughs> 
So, um, Cecilia Mark Herbert, uh, lecturer and researcher in business economics, will lead this discussion. So, I will leave the floor to her and Anna. Is it on? Yeah. <laughs> Annars finns det en som är grön här. Ja. Mm. Tack. Ja, springer över det där. Mm. Nu blev vi en liten intim grupp. Ja. Jättekul. Ja. Jag ville ställa mig till Engels som tackar dig så hemskt mycket för en supertrevlig och inspirerande presentation. Tack. Och eh, inspirera er andra och uppmuntra er andra att som är med här nu i fortsatt diskussion att eh, ställa svåra och roliga frågor till Anna för nu har vi vår chans. In English, sorry. Okay, we'll swap, swap. I'm sorry. Um, I would like to encourage you all to ask Anna all kinds of questions that you have on, on top of your mind. And before I let the audience in, I figured that I would um, just like to ask you a question of, of my own mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. on top of my head when you were making your presentation. Um, you have a facilitating role, uh, VVF, uh, in making uh, both business, everyone in the value chain, I would use the value chain concept rather than the supply chain, mm -hmm. to communicate with one another. Are you including uh, governmental agencies and other NGOs and, and consumer organizations as well? Because I did not see them listed no. in the initiatives. Well, that's a very good, good uh, question. For example, the sustain Sustainable Supply Chain for Food, I mean, that's a company initiative. But we have checked all our stuff against the competition agency. Konkurrensverket, so that we are clear what we can actually agree on, so we don't do unfair competition. And we also uh, have been looking quite a lot at the materials from the procurement agency, Upphandlingsmyndigheten. Mm. Uh, so they have, and we have been in, in quite close dialogue actually, and they love what we do. We think their procurement criteria are, are you know, well created and well established, so we tried to get some of our stuff close to them. So that, that way we meet them. We, we don't meet Naturvårdsverket, the Board of uh, Environment, mm. uh, EPA, the EPA, EPA. Yeah. Uh, or Jordbruksverket, the Board of Agriculture, that often. And uh, we haven't really included them as a dialogue part, but, but we try to see that we have regular checkups with them. And uh, for example, we were here in Uppsala to check up with the board Livsmedelsverket, the food agency. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, sh we discussed the One Planet Plate and our guides and how they work with communication and try to you know, see that we go in line and where, where, where we differ, we need to know. So that way we... So know. the governmental agencies are in, in your discussion form, so to yeah. speak, but Konsumentföreningen and, and other organizations representing yeah. other interests than that of the government, have you included them as well? Not enough, in my personal opinion, actually. Um, we have a network, actually, of, of interesting organizations, it's animal welfare organizations, the consumer organizations, mm -hmm. and the environmental organizations. And that was created for uh, lobbying on the Swedish food strategy. So right. we meet uh, now and then, and there are seminars in Almedal, and it, it's actually convened by an ex-colleague of uh, Pernilla and mine called Gunilla Ståle. So we have, we have uh, they're in our network, okay. but okay. we don't, I mean, somehow it's also a bit, so, you know, competition. We do this, you do that, or not competition, but uh, um, we split roles. So the... Society for Nature Conservation, they do quite a lot of focus on organic, and WWF does not. Mm -hmm. So we you know, split our roles up and have different roles in the system. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> I have other questions, but I'll save those and leave some room for the audience to contribute as mm -hmm. well. Thank you. Do anyone want to start off? We have uh, one question uh, left from, mm -hmm. from the previous session, so I will leave the mic. Yeah, I'm very curious about the very interesting, exciting 
um, concept of one planet plate. Mm. Uh, as far as I understand, the kind of the limit roof uh, is uh, the carbon the carbon footprint. Mm. It is stated how much we mm. can eat of different kind, and we, it will also steer the diet mm. over a yeah. week, for instance. Uh, how do you handle and treat uh, the trade-off here between biodiversity mm. and climate mitigation mm. and how will for instance this uh, proposed uh, diet over a week mm. affect the Swedish environmental quality objective for di- biodiversity mm. yeah well, that's a, a really difficult question because we would actually like to see more natural pasture meat so a way for us to address what you are saying is to separate production and consumption we talk okay, consumption of meat needs to be substantially lowered, but we don't say that about the production of meat, and specifically the production of natural pasture beef and lamb should be actually increase, increasing if we should, if Sweden should achieve its environmental targets. So we need these animals. And that means that we had, it was quite a struggle because we have this climate limit and we know that there's not much room for an animal, and particularly beef, and particularly beef from natural pastures, which are high in climate impact. So that is a, a, a problem, actually. But we can also see that, okay, this uh, one planet plate is a long-term vision. And of course, we want people to uh, act on it as quickly as possible. But um, in the meanwhile, steps to take the first step would be to take out you know, meat that is not natural pasture meat or meat that does not contribute to the system in a way. So that means we sort of get a picture of, well, okay, this is long-term goal and here are some, some steps that we can take now on the way. Uh, so splitting it up time-wise has been a strategy for me to you know, handle that type of discussion. Um, and you also asked if we were eating according to the climate what would that, that do with our possibilities to meet the environmental targets on biodiversity? Well, uh, it would be difficult, actually. It's an honest answer. <laughs> and uh, oh. and uh, uh, that is um, something that we're going to have to be dealing much more with as we're coming up, because I didn't... I forgot to tell you that in the beginning, but WWF is going into a campaign on biodiversity. I think the organization is a bit scared of all this, inf- uh, all this climate talk, people talking climate here. So, okay, biodiversity, here we go. And, and uh, uh, we are also going to be working much more on natural pasture beef and lamb, which I think is wonderful because I think that you can't actually find that meat in stores. So we need to, you know, expose it and get people to look for it and choose for it and to balance that with our one planet plate somehow. So, you know, put a lot of uh, things in our portfolio and the the general average is probably good. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was curious about uh, the part where you talked about the sustainable food chain. And uh, you talked about the uh, third party. Can you verific- speak? Ah, oh, sorry. You talked about uh, that um, some kind of third party verifica- verification yeah. of some sustainability aspects. Yeah. Uh, what could that look like? Or do you have some kind yeah. of, what could it be? Well, uh, good question. So, so some of the companies have their own initiatives. For example, this concept that Lantmännen is using and actually all of Polarbröds bread is, uh, is with this concept. So that means that they have large plots in the fields and they have lower climate impact. So there are climate measures and there are biodiversity measures in this uh, concept. And it's verified by an external partner. It's transparent and it's relevant. It's highly relevant. So that is a system that could qualify, for example. Uh, we at WWF have said we're not going to go out and promote company systems. They're going to have to do that themselves. But this is a way for them, for example, Lantmen, and when they go to ICA, they can say, um, okay, look here, we have a concept that is uh, Venlier Viet. It actually qualifies in this uh, 
top level. So we should be paid more for this. <laughs> and uh, so that could be a discussion. As it is today, I guess they can say that we have climate-friendly production without being uh, verified from third party. But that, I mean, if they are third party verified, then it's really more... I don't know if consumers make any difference, difference in... No. Uh, they don't know about no. this verification. And, no. I, mean, uh, I don't know what my question was, but uh, I think it's really good. But mm -hmm. then if you have a certification like... Uh, or organic, organic, then people know that mm -hmm. uh, this is something reliable behind mm -hmm. it. But if you do like a statement that we have climate friendly produced wheat mm. uh, without the label, mm. then it's quite difficult, actually. It, this whole area is extremely difficult. And if you ask me, it's I think consumers know absolutely nothing. The only thing that they are able to act on are, is organic. And they actually think that organic is much more than it is. So the perception of the consumer is quite difficult to work with. Um, I, Lantmannen have had, uh, move, uh, you know, when you go to the movies, you, you see the uh, advertisements in, in uh, films before the film starts, and they have been showing, you know, picture of the farmer, the large plots, and things like that. It's a way of getting it out into society, but uh, they haven't uh, uh, made much progress, I think, actually. Because people don't know about it, and it's going to take a really, really long time. So the question is actually if you're, how, how yeah. and I think that might be an, an interesting thing for a business model study. You know, how how can you how can you promote a system like that without leaving it all to the consumer to want to know or to pay more? Is there a, can you you know advance these systems even if the consumer isn't a driving force? If you're in the following course after Penilla's course, we'll talk about that. Exactly that. Good. Branding. <laughs> Co branding and branding and what yeah. is portfolio management. So we're talking about these issues, exactly these issues. Good. <laughs> we now have three queuing questions. You first, and then. Yeah. I have a question that uh, uh, is connected to the question that Penilla asked. Uh, it's about the one planet plate that you spoke about. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question is, how local does WWF think when trying to frame the plate? Oh. So, um, to explain the question, mm -hmm. um, would it be a plate for just Upland County or Sweden, or would it be a Nordic diet plate, mm -hmm. or would it be a Europe plate? Mm -hmm. How local does WWF think well, on when, a question like this? When it comes to the climate, it can actually be global. So this climate target can be a global target and it can be used anywhere. The tricky part is the biodiversity. That needs to have local uh, aspects. And I mean, there aren't meat guides in the, the Nordic, Nordic countries except for Finland. And uh, the, they have fish guides, but... Uh, all, but, and all of them have the, the organic. So, I mean, it, it would be possible to do a one planet plate for a Nordic setting. If, if we were to go out in Europe, it would be more difficult, and then the difficulty increases as you go into contexts that are less similar. But it's interesting because I'm actually going to, I, I have to confess, I'm going to go on an airplane <laughs> to, to Zambia because there's a global WWF food meeting uh, next week. And the, so we are telling them what we're doing here with the supply chain, with the one planet plate, and you know, trying to discuss how how other offices can move this forward. And I mean, some of the offices are we're only work, working on soy, or we're only working on the global f fish uh, industry. So it's quite different. But we're sowing some seeds to thought to bring it into a global context. Thank you. Before we let the next question in, can I just add something? Yeah. And that's an, an addition to the previous question. Um, we live in a globalized world where people travel and they eat uh, foods from other continents, etc., etc. And the, since the WWF standards aren't consistent, mm -hmm. uh, I know that with the fish guide, for example, tiger shrimp are, are on the red list in mm -hmm. Sweden, 
and you don't have to go very much further than Germany to find them on the yellow list. Mm -hmm. And if, if they are certified and, and in Sweden on the red list, and mm -hmm. of course they're not produced in Sweden, so it seems, or Germany for that matter, mm -hmm. so it seems really difficult for mm -hmm. consumers to see the consistency mm -hmm. when we get, and, and as consumers we get so many messages of what we should do and shouldn't do, so that's something that maybe you could take to, to your meet next week, is to say, <laughs> How can we, changing food habits takes a long yeah. time. We only do it a few times in our lives when, when we mm. change from breastfeeding and when, mm. we, when we have the first heart attack and, and such. That's when we are willing to change and to negotiate our yeah. food habits. So guides mm. that are guiding our behavior mm. needs to be consistent. Mm. So I'm well, wondering what I, you have to say to that. I would argue against you, though, because I think that for for the consumer it's not a problem because no consumer is going to in Sweden is going to say, oh well, that one has a yellow light in the German guide. The, they're not going to do that. It becomes a problem, however, for the companies who are yes. active in yeah. different areas. Yeah. So Axe Food, for example, or Ica, or yeah. or Orkla, or Fatser, or one of the companies that are need you know, for consistency. Yeah. So that is actually bad for us that the guides are not consistent mm -hmm. and the reason for that being bad is well of course they need to be consistent but it also opens us to attack i mean yeah. this the, the um, retailers they are not really comfortable with us asking them to act here so if we you know if if they find an occasion to say well that guide is not credible look it goes different in different countries blah 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 mm -hmm. and so that that thereby they you know lower our credibility yeah so for us, it, that, that's extremely important. Mm. And we can see Tiger Shunt being one example. Mm. Axford has taken a stand, not mm. selling it. So they have taken that out mm. in portfolio management altogether. Mm. Whereas the other, Ica and, and Coop, mm. have not mm. for the reasons that you're just saying. Yeah, yeah. So they are troubled. Yeah. Well, thank you for letting me I, I think that tiger shrimp issue is quite interesting, though, it because is. it's such a minor part in our diets. How can tiger shrimp even become an issue in Sweden? I mean, I, I never eat tiger. I, I see it. Okay, I see it sometimes when I eat sushi, but uh, that's yeah, weird. And it, can, <laughs> and it can be replaced by other kind of shrimp at mm. that time as mm. well. Yeah, we had other questions. Okay, my turn. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. I mean... It, it, the more I sit and listen to this and listen to the questions being asked, the greater my understanding of the complexity of the whole thing is. Mm. Um, and I could go on about that forever and have many questions. But one of the things you mentioned was eating soil. Mm. Now, that's the e first eating, time I've... Eating soil. Soil? Yes. Huh? Consuming soil. Did, or did I mishear you? Oh, continue and I'll see if I well, understand. Because I mean, in, in a sense, any agriculture is using soil. Mm. And there may be a few places in the world where farming practice actually enhances and increases soil, but I think in general, mm. agriculture leads to soil loss. Mm. And soil replacement is a very slow process. So in, in, a, in a sense, it's not a renewable resource. Mm. So I was just wondering to what extent you bring that kind of thinking into, um, mm. in, in, into your ideas about a, a, a plate yeah. that's... Uh, I'll give you an example because in this uh, long term, uh, in this roadmap for the countries, uh, for the companies that we are developing in the sustainable supply chain initiative, one of the things that we are thinking about adding, it's not ready yet, but it's in our in the portfolio, is uh, to have uh, tar make the companies set targets for no sim no systematic lowering of soil carbon. And actually, it would be interesting if we could tweak it so that it would be, you know, contain systematic increase of soil carbon. So we have to find out what is possible, what is uh, desirable. If you listen to Johan Rockström et al, increasing soil carbon is what we're going to have to do. And if it's uh, biological carbon or if it's biochar or whatever, uh, technical carbon, uh, that's, you know, a big <laughs> discussion. But the agri agronomic practices to, to halt the loss of soil carbon and that, you know, bringing with it the effects of increased uh, water holding capacity, blah, uh, all the components of soil fertility. So if we could get like a, t a benchmark uh, or a target on, on soil carbon, I think that would be quite interesting actually.
Shall we give the microphone so that the other people outside can hear? It's um, it's about the the science itself, which is contested. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you know you're taking science and and scientific evidence, but you're only going to be selecting certain parts of it yeah. as they fit with your values <laughs> and your beliefs about what need to be done. So you know that just makes the whole thing that much more complex. Mm. And in a sense, what we're trying to do is shift societal values in a, in a major way yeah. with regard to agriculture and food. Mm. Well, what you say about picking the cherries out of the cake in science, I think that's done by many, and I, we are probably as bad as everyone else. Uh, I don't really know what to answer to that one. Uh, because I think it's uh, important to listen to different areas of science. But we also need to step forward somehow. And if we see that the food system has a pot potential to contribute, uh, how can, I mean, would it not be good if the companies did something along this measure? I mean, we know that uh, it's difficult to work with this. I mean, what type of carbon, long term carbon or short term carbon? What what actually increases the water holding capacity of the soil? And there are such a lot of issues to be studied. So the systematics there is uh, it is as you say extremely complex. Complex. Um, I just had a question about going back to like the global scale, and I think partly it's been answered. But um, it seems like uh, WWF Sweden is very high standards and they do great jobs uh, mm. with food, uh, sustainability, but, um, and I was wondering what's the role or how, uh, whether they give support to other countries that don't have the uh, capacities, for example, to, that Sweden has mm. uh, at this level, mm. and uh, whether, uh, how pushy can WWF be mm. in uh, pushing these initiatives yeah. in other countries, and whether it would have to lower its standards as soon as we get out of Sweden because of um, yeah, because yeah. of the difficulties of uh, yeah. the problematic. In, problematic we're actually in seeing that happening when we're, the meat guide is taking off in different countries. That, uh, for example, our standards for animal welfare in the Sw Swedish meat guides are quite high, and uh, France mm -hmm. is asking us, well, can we lower this? And they're seeing that all their meat is getting red light, <laughs> which uh, we could have told them from the start. But So we develop things here for our context. And when we, it goes global, we did. Well, <laughs> it was quite interesting because because uh, we're having quite difficult discussions now that the meat guides are going global, especially because of things that you are saying that they need to be synchronized. Mm -hmm. So we are not actually there. But I, my personal view is that we should develop things that function in in our context. And if they don't work when they go abroad, maybe we, they they could be different. Or we, we, I mean, I am right now in favor of, for example, Austria developing a guide without antibiotics and animal welfare because they don't have the potential to do that type of work, and they have another organization that does it. So they would be, uh, you know, in conflict with an organization that is usually quite good. So that means that the guides will will look different. Mm. Uh, I think that's that's reason. It's reasonable that it's going to happen that way. Yeah, the, the question here was if there's any support from WWF Sweden. And what we have put in money to, to right now is the coordination of meat guides and sustainable diets. So we finance a 50% person who is working on this coordination issue. And that's just to get uh, uh, us mm -hmm. uh, uh, talking together and convening and, mm -hmm. and uh, discussing these things. But we haven't actually, we don't go say you should do this or... Uh, that uh, uh, prescribe something. But something that's quite interesting, I mean, for example, Germany funded through uh, a mechanism that they have a lot of work in Southeast Asia on diets. And we have, uh, WWF in Sweden has a lot of money through SIDA. So if that could be somehow tweaked to you know, help, for example, in African countries with the uh, development of their food systems as the wealth grows and the habits change, 
uh, that would be ex interesting, but we're not there yet. But uh, there is a potential to do that. Hmm? I have actually a quite subjective impression to add because I'm not from Sweden, so I'm from Germany. Hmm? And I know that, like, in general, I think according uh, like animal welfare and all the standards are quite high in Sweden. But I just wanted to, when I arrived here, I had really hard times to actually get my food in a way that I was used to so that I could stay with my standards because it's like maybe the general Belge seems to be more sustainability here from this. Well, but like the furthest point, I think it's really hard to be in this part here in Sweden because it's really hard when you go to Ica, for example, and Ica mm. seems to be like quite ahead with sustainability mm. when I listened. And mm. Like in the apple season in Sweden, there are 90% of the apples are from yeah. uh, not from Sweden, yeah. and the only organic certified ones are mm -hmm. from Italy or Chile mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't get actually uh, grass-fed meat in Ica, mm -hmm. and I so mm -hmm. it's and vegetables are to find vegetables from Sweden. You really mm -hmm. have to look at every package and mm -hmm. to find them. So you need, really need to and there are not these farmer's markets that are mm. actually common in Germany. Mm. Every day you can go to a farmer's market mm. and just mm. buy it. Mm. You have that here once a week, maybe. Yeah, and then you have a market, for example, in central Stockholm where they sell me apples from, uh, from Chile. Yeah. That's kind of weird also. So I, 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 I think it's really strange. For, uh, it yeah. was really strange for me to see ICA on such yeah. a sustainability <laughs> thing. <laughs> So that is my impression. So yeah. I'm like, yeah. okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, I, I agree. They do wonderful things. They have, so for example, a climate system now where you can, if you have an Ike card, you can get uh, on that card information of the climate impact of everything that you buy, mm -hmm. which is quite innovative. And they do wonderful things with their fish guide, but there's a lot of things left to do. Uh, so uh, that's, all, I mean, we need, and that is the difficult thing actually with being a convening part in a dialogue like that. Because we, at the same time, need to challenge them. So if uh, it's a balance there, if we get them, if we are perceived as a neutral part and you know establishing trust, but we want to hit them on the head at the same time, um, it's, that's that's, uh, that's a bit challenging. So uh, I I can see what you say, and I think I agree, and I think, but I think Ike still deserves to be on there, but they are not fully sustainable and I think they know that very well it's all a part of the business model mm. Mm. Uh, I have a question here uh, I think uh, hello Mats in Skara hey. <laughs> hi uh, really really interesting I think you're doing a really good job uh, at WWF. Uh, I, was, I would like to come back to the question around how can the consumer understand a uh, whole this issue. I think it's really comp complex, of course, and, and you're doing a lot of uh, good consumer tools, but how do you get it out? I, I think about uh, pupils in schools and, and so on. What, what, what are your plans there? Yeah. Okay, in schools, schools is actually the easy part because we have a cur curriculum uh, our package developed for schools, up, I think it's up until grade nine, which is okay. available on our website and we spread it through our channels. So I think that is the easy part, but how to reach the other consumers. We don't actually have any other channels than our Facebook site, uh, our website, in our Instagram, Twitter, and you know the amazing amount of flow of materials that are out there. So we... we Oh, and one thing, the Earth Hour campaign. So WWF has com campaigns, and uh, right now we're in the middle of a biodiversity campaign, and there is usually an oceans campaign, and there's uh, an Arctic campaign, and Earth Hour is one of them. And into Earth Hour, we, t we try to cram in food as much as we can. So in March and beginning April, we, that's our window of talking food uh, in, uh, in our communications channels. Uh, hi, Thomas here. From, hey. um, thank you for your presentation and, and for the work you're doing. Um, some reflec reflections, uh, considering 
WWF as a neutral party. I don't think everybody would agree on that. Uh, it's an interesting, <laughs> it's an interesting uh, um, uh, statement. Uh, but looking up to the title of this of today, I mean, making use of research. Mm -hmm. um, I think that question possibly is, is not formulated the way it should, mm -hmm. because what we need is for you to be there when we define the kind of research that we should do, mm -hmm. rather than waiting for it and trying to see what we can do with it. Mm. Uh, and how do you see that coming up where we get better interaction mm -hmm. defining and helping uh, helping out in defining research questions? Yeah. We lack those arenas, I think. Yeah. Uh, sometimes FORMAS has new programs, uh, and it would be interesting for us, for example, to take a part in developing those programs. I honestly don't know, because that happens in another level of WWF than where I am. Uh, but I actually took the opportunity to participate in some evaluation uh, panels just to see how is uh, how, you know, the research, w which e research ta is going to go uh, take place uh, and, and w how and why. And that was quite interesting to me. Uh, I think uh, I had lots of uh, uh, opinions and thoughts after that on what could be done better and how it could be worked. Uh, you know, more functional uh, panels to evaluate research. So both those two sides, you know, evaluating what uh, proposals and participating in what research actually comes up, but also pre, uh, pre uh, that stage to develop research programs. And I think that Future Food, for example, and uh, uh, the, the one before that, Moche et, um, uh, I'm not sure if WWF was a part of much yet. I, pr I think probably not. I think we're not part of future food. Or we think, I think we like future food. <laughs> but I think we would... Uh, um, it would be quite interesting, actually. And strategically, if you consider what to put your energy into, I think that might be a good way to you know, see to it that development is happening according to what we think is important. Följdfråga. Uh, I think it's important that we try to create um, not a one-off occasion where we define what should happen. I think mm -hmm. we need to find a continuous process where we interact. Uh, and one of that, one of them could be, because we're all there, is mm -hmm. to, to do it when we're in Visby and Almedalen, to have a, a day set off for defining uh, mm -hmm. topics for research, mm -hmm. where we could bring in both researchers and consumer organizations like mm -hmm. Janne Bertoft or... or mm -hmm. Well, uh, not well. He is not a consumer organization, but he's heading it. Yeah. He <laughs> I think that could be a very important thing. And you have a Coesela has a, a symposium, mm -hmm. and there is one on dairy. But when the dairy researchers uh, want to bring out uh, future research uh, issues, they only ask the sector. They did never ask mm -hmm. the consumers. Mm -hmm. um, they have a symposium coming up on the 28th of January about mm -hmm. dairy. What should we do f in terms of research? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, th that's not the tradition within research t to have that kind of interaction. Uh, they, are, they are fond of the industry, but not of the consumers. Just one yeah. uh, little comment there. That's that there is a group at QSL that's led by Inger Andersson, it's Värde Gruppen, and it has Louise Ungert in it. So the consumers are certainly re represented there. Consumer organizations are represented. And most of the seminars there are with the ambition to include both industry and uh, governmental organizations as well as NGOs. And since those seminars are most often open seminars, many of these issues are brought up. Mm. And Inger has also had a hand uh, collaborating with DeNova and with Formas for mm. formulating the, fo the coming calls for research. So she Which is, is she, good, yeah, but I don't think it's enough. I think there is much more to do in terms of, of getting... Yeah, I agree. Oh. I think you, we might miss some things because there's so, such a lot of things happening in this world uh, that we sometimes don't make the right uh, choices of where to do and where to put in our energy. So it might be that we have been invited but we're not, uh, did not uh, get a correct impression of what we were, why we should actually be there. <laughs> so uh, that's partly on, on me but also on my organization. You know, where, who gets the question? How is it lifted up in our organization? We don't have really functional methods for that, actually. 
But you do have functional methods of talking with the industry, and that's mm -hmm. key. Yes. And there's a long tradition in the Swedish food, food actor network, one mm. should say, of talking. I mm. mean, we see this palm oil initiative, we see mm. the Soya Dialogue, we see the Egenot Yerts Programmet, mm -hmm. where the whole industry sat around in a very uncomfortable, I would imagine, a uh, conversation with, led by Neil Stewart Asp at the mm -hmm. time, talking about what we could say about health aspects regarding food. Mm -hmm. So the Swedish food actors have a tradition of trying to seek solutions that everyone can be agree on. And, and uh, WWF has had an important role in many of these conversations. So, so you, you are close to the industry, so maybe if you're not as close to the research just yet, you should give yourselves credit for being very good with the industry, pushing yeah. them and supporting them in the process. Yeah. Because they are very far ahead. Mm -hmm. That's good, thanks. And also a reflection on the Swedish food strategy. I think we have been quite critical about this you know, increasing production without uh, giving attention to the environmental goals. But, so that part of the food strategy we are quite upset with. But, but the research and the innovation and uh, the, that, that part is quite in, uh, interesting. There may be you know, an increased focus that is not politically complicated. Most, pe most parties should be able to support that for innovation and mm -hmm. research and development in the food sector, and we think that's wonderful. Uh, I have a very broad question, yes. and I'm just interested to hear you reflect upon it. Uh, and that's what's happening internationally outside the WWF. Mm -hmm. uh, just an example, 12 years ago, something when we were, me and Anna were working with climate certification of food, uh, the hot topic uh, internationally, that was climate, uh, th that was carbon footprint. Mm. Make uh, label with a figure, an exact number, the, mm. the carbon um, footprint for a lot of products. And Tesco, they announced that they aimed for a uh, carbon footprint on, I don't know, mm. 20,000 products, something. Mm. And then I think they, I mean, it was impossible and we, we knew it. <laughs> Uh, so, but what what's the hot topic outside Sweden internationally right now? Is it still a discussion how to label products, or are other countries uh, working more with sustainable diets as we work here in Sweden? And what's what's happening? Like just mm -hmm. kind of reflections. Yeah. I have a, a a reflection there is that the COP in uh, Poland will start soon. And uh, last year's COP was the first time that there was a climate uh, discussion, or well, not first, but I mean, agriculture is coming up as a uh, put up issue and potential solution and a, a part in the climate talks. And that's going to happen more at this COP and probably even more at the next COP. So to get agriculture into the climate talks, that is something that is ongoing. Uh, and I think that's good and wonderful. That, that so enables a focus on, for example, what you were ask, asking about there in the back, uh, about uh, yeah. land deg degradation and soil quality, and ha discussing soil quality as a part of uh, climate, both adaptation and mitigation. So that type of discussion is ongoing. Um, I would say that the, the discussion on sustainable diets is growing, but globally it's... Uh, it's lagging. Um, and for WWF did a, a survey, and uh, I mean, that's why they, they are putting a lot of focus on South, Southeast Asia, these areas where there's a lot of population growth, a big transformation ongoing, uh, and uh, uh, a, a need to work on the sustainable diets. Um, I also think that deforestation and deforestation free is coming up mm -hmm. as, a, as an issue. And uh, I mean biodiversity to some extent, but that's uh, I think that's uh, still a big lack of tools, analysis, ways. But it used to be that uh, we, uh, I mean I only got on my radar a couple of uh, uh, one one or two years ago these Aichi targets for biodiversity, and they are I mean they're like the Sustainable Development Goals there are. Uh, or, and, or the IPCC. I mean, it's an international constellation working with biodiversity and uh, setting targets. So, so maybe there's a hope for the 
biodiversity too, actually. I would say that carbon footprinting is is mo uh, moving away to uh, from business. Do you because spell the name of this? A I C H I Aichi targets. Uh, let's see. I would say the carbon footprinting, as you say, it's it's not even emerging. Uh, I mean, I got the question a couple of days ago from Lantman, and they were early in that too. But uh, I think that uh, we kn we know it was really difficult. And actually, I'm going to talk to my French colleague next week and see what is happening in France because they have been quite early on the climate uh, labeling of food and they also have quite open public, publicly available databases on this, which is interesting. Are they using the traffic light? No, that's, that's, a, that's a carbon uh, uh, declaration system okay. where they put a figure on the okay. package. Do you have any comments about the traffic light, the use of that? I'm, I'm, as a marketing person, mm -hmm. I'm very, very much yeah. in favor of it because it's simple. Anyone can understand it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to read. You don't have. To, you can mm -hmm. understand a traffic light. So I'm wondering what your reflection is on a traffic light as a. Way I think of it's really it. difficult though because because it's a, such an enormous simplification. Yeah. I mean, we're we're talking about. Uh, uh, I mean, well, it's a it's a big simplification, but we're talking about that in the veggie guide right now. How we will do. Mm -hmm how we will work with mm. the traffic light system. Mm. And introducing another traffic signal, the warning signal, mm. uh, might be a way forward. And uh, so, but uh, 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 I think in many cases it's too simple. And actually, it's been a problem for us that uh, it's too simple. Yeah. It causes problems. It does cause problems, but it also helps consumers. And I'm hoping that, mm. uh, that there is some kind of, I'm thinking of the keyhole. Mm -hmm. that researchers from all over the world is looking at the Swedish mm -hmm. model for communicating what's healthy and what's mm -hmm. less healthy. Um, and it has been praised abroad, mm -hmm. whereas we are very critical ourselves mm -hmm. of it because it's mm -hmm. simple. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the criteria, it's not simple. No, not no. at all. <laughs> but, but looking at it, yeah. you, I mean, it's a very straightforward yeah. thing. And if you health something healthy or something less, oh, I'll go for that one. Yeah. Very easy. And we take about three seconds in mm. the food store to pick our, our yeah. items. So it can't be complicated. It has but to be simple. red light in a retail store can sometimes mean that it's 30% cheaper because the best before that's, date is coming true. close. That's so you get a red light. Oh, that's <laughs> cheaper. And so I, I do a good thing. I take the red light. So it's hard to know what people actually yeah. think. Yeah. I, that's, pro that's only off the top of my head. I don't know if it's been researched or anything. Well. Might have to pick up on that. <laughs> There are five minutes to go, and we have three questions right. waiting, and then I think we yeah. will have to stop. So, first one up. Uh, you mentioned in the beginning of the session, session that you communicate with the Swedish food agency, mm -hmm. but I was wondering, like, to what extent or do you communicate or collaborate with the Swedish food agency? The food agency, Livsmelsverket, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I mean, they are they are really crucial because they have their food advice and they also collect a lot of information that we're interested in. For example, Riksmaten, mm -hmm. they made a study of, of what young people eat, mm -hmm. which we actually took in and used and, and processed. And that's much more credible than our studies where we ask a thousand people, but they have much a larger base and a different, type, different way of asking. And it also... Uh, 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 makes a difference who is asking. So if we ask young people if they're vegetarian, they're more likely to say yes, probably. But if Lismelsveket asks, and the, the, so Lismelsveket gets lower figures on how much young people actually eat vegetarian food than we do. So we, we need for their data, and we also need for our messages not to be conflicting. So that's why we need to talk to them on what we do. They think our One Planet Plate is interesting. They can't do something like that, but they can you know, take it into their minds and be inspired by it and so So it's more on that level. Um, back to research again, sorry. <laughs> or actually the interface between research and business. Mm -hmm. um, have you been discussing within your group here of, of businesses, the, the uh, big data collection and how we're going to be able to use all the data that's in there. Of mm -hmm. course, they want to use their own data, mm -hmm. uh, which they have access to, mm -hmm. but 
have you discussed creating tools on top of that data that could simplify our understanding? Mm. That's, uh, that's where we are right now, because uh, that's also the question for WWF. How long can we be in an initiative like this? Uh, I mean, until we feel that we need to back off because, back off because no progress is made. So, uh, and to know that, we have to have tools for measuring, reporting, uh, evaluation of progress. And so this is what's ongoing right now, how to measure pro progress. And we have a working group on it. Uh, they're working on the barcode system for the certifications, but the barcode system won't cover the uh, raising the bottom, lifting the bottom. So that's something that needs to be developed. How do we actually follow up on that? And we don't know. So they won't ever tr share their big data with us. We're talking about you know, aggregated data collection, something that we can uh, you know, use to collect information on progress and how progress is being made. No, you won't, you won't get their data, but you could create tools on top of their data, joint tools mm -hmm. that could go into their data and mm -hmm. find out what's happening. That could even be an interesting measure for them to mm -hmm. compare with each other. If you have one like that, we can talk more, I think. <laughs> I think it sounds interesting. Uh, we know, I mean, it's me, Magis, and Camilla, and it's under finance, so we don't have any consultants in there. And I mean, we need smart thoughts on this uh, measuring, reporting, and evaluation. So we're not there yet. Oh, joint application. But what if I'm on the evaluation board? You can, that's not good. <laughs> Oh, maybe we just touched an idea. My boss has actually told me that I cannot have any more ideas. Now we need to you know, work with what we have. <laughs> we have five years at WWF and all this, and <laughs> something's happening, and gray hairs, and people are getting sick, and sjukskriven, uh, or whatever. So, but uh, maybe you can do the work, and I can, we can talk. <laughs> so we have a question. Yeah. Yes. Final question. Thank you. Uh, Josefina, I'm from the Department of Economics here at SLU. Um, and I'm just cu curious, um, what is now the strategy for approaching uh, all of the other consumers and companies that does not value these like health and sustainability issues? Mm -hmm. Good question. Okay, so sustainable supply chain for food, we checked with the competition agency and we can sit 14 persons or uh, companies around the table and do work like this if we also agree that it's transparent. So we put all the stuff on our website and what we're now doing is we're talking in Livsmills Forum, Livsmills Dagarna and uh, whenever we can and saying for companies to use this. It's a, it's a tool, it's a template, it's something that you can take into discussions with procurement, a pro procurement dialogue. So we need for other companies to work on this too. too. And it's like a present because this has been taken a couple of years and it's a lot of time and money invested, little money, lots of time invested in it. So we're giving this away for free to companies who want. And for example, Livs Mills for Tagen, the trade agency for food producers in Sweden. They looked at it and say, oh wow, now we don't have to do that work. We just can just share it with all our members. So we get the organizations to spread it out for us because we also don't have any communication channels or, or strategies. So it's me and Magis who do things like this, go out and talk to strategic places where we can reach out and get a good you know, uh, utveckling, a good result of what the time we're putting down. Hmm? Thank you. That was a very good last question, I think. I hope you all save up for questions for continued dialogues with WWF at some other times. Mm -hmm. And before you leave, I'd just like to, on the behalf of all of us at SLU, thank you very much for coming. It's been very enlightening and uh, very inspiring. Thank you. I hope that the students got some ideas for a thesis and mm -hmm. projects to come mm -hmm. and an understanding of the importance of the roles, the many roles that WWF fills. Great. And I was th thinking about this thesis idea also. We, we have to talk about with Penilla and Hanna and, uh, and everybody I know how to do it in a structured way so that you just don't overflow with me. Because I usually say no and no and no, but the, if we get a structured way to do this, I think we're fine. <laughs> Super. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.